Okay. Hello, everyone. I'm Dr. Robert Watson, professor of American Studies at Lynn University. <laughs> Thank you. Welcome to Lynn University, and welcome to the Wald Center for the Performing Arts, site of the last presidential debate in 2012, and still probably the site of the last real presidential debate. Um, before we get into our comments uh, on civility, uh, I want to let you know we host a number of uh, literary, cultural, theatrical, musical performances here at Lynn, and I'd like to invite you to come back to them. Our staff is in the box office out front on the left on your way out. Um, on uh, next Wednesday, we have another civility panel here at noon featuring four leaders of the news media. We're going to talk about how do we cover the incivility. We'll talk about the fake news, alternative facts, and things of that effect. I'd also like to invite you on April 20th. Nancy Spielberg is coming to screen her new documentary, and then she'll be taking questions. Uh, we filled out, uh, we filled all the seats here. So I want to announce on April 20th at 7 p.m. we're going to move the venue. It'll be at the Spanish River Church where all the concerts are. That's 1,500 seats. I'm sure a lot of you have been to shows there. They have good acoustics, so we'll be moving it there, and there's still some seats available since we moved it to a larger venue. Also, on April 28th, at the end of the month, one of our fa at end of April, one of our favorite programs on campus, our Celebration of the Arts. This is where we feature our students and their talents, everything from poetry to music to dance. It's an uh, evening starting at 5.30 of all sorts of every genre of the, of the performing arts. We even have food trucks coming and all that. That's April 28th. Uh, so come and check our impressive students. Uh, the tickets will be at the box office on your way out. This program, this civility initiative, we're going to continue it next year. So please get on our mailing list. We have some wonderful programs for you for next year. Josh Aronson, the wonderful Hollywood filmmaker, is coming in uh, to talk about his outstanding Academy Award nominated uh, documentary. Uh, all about the Holocaust. It's called a, uh, An Orchestra of Exiles. Uh, it's about a Polish violinist who got a couple of hundred Jewish musicians out of Germany right before the Holocaust started, and they would go on to form Israel's first orchestra. He'll be here to screen his movie and talk about it. CNN's White House correspondent will be here to talk about the White House press pool uh, and a number of other events on that. Uh, there's a couple of people I want to thank and acknowledge before we move on. Uh, Dr. Kevin Ross, the president of Lynn University, Dr. Greg Cox, our vice president of academic affairs, and Dr. Katrina carter Tellison, our dean of arts and sciences. All were enthusiastic and helped make this program possible. We have an array of civic engagement and civility initiatives on campus, and I'd like to acknowledge our excellent committee that helps me with all these programs, Roberto Cadile, uh, Professor Antonella Reguero, Professor Tamea Varga, and uh, Dr. Uh, Alessandro Rosa are part of the committee that put on these programs, so thank you uh, for all that you do. I think we'd all agree that um, probably the most pressing issue facing us today is the incivility. Before we can sit down and address any public problem, we need to at least be able to sit down and have a conversation and break bread together. Debate, disagreement, and dissent are not necessarily problems. I would argue the opposite. I think they're essential ingredients for a democracy. However, as long as they are constructive, fact-based, and most importantly, civil. Uh, so to that end, uh, we've launched a new initiative on campus called Project Civitas and I'd like you to visit our online social media sources and weigh in on Lynn Project Civitas. This campus is a special place. I think you would agree that uh, campuses all across the country have been plagued uh, by a rash of hate speech and hate crimes lately. Uh, it seems like every day there's swastikas being painted on campuses, there's hateful, sexist, anti-Semitic and bigoted comments on college campuses. I was at Vassar, just a week and a half ago, and a student paper was filled with examples of three horrific hate crimes, including swastikas being painted on that marvelous campus. Uh, however, Lynn University is an oasis. Uh, we don't have any of that nonsense here, and I think it's part of our culture. 
Uh, we have something called the Citizenship Project, whereby our entire freshman class, every January, devotes much of the month to community service going out into the community. Our core curriculum, all of our students take a curriculum called the Dialogues, whereby they're reading great tracts on civility, from Sojourner Truth's Ain't I a Woman, to Nelson Mandela, to um, uh, Gandhi, to Martin Luther King, uh, to Henry David Thoreau's on civil disobedience. It's part of what we do. Uh, this month, we got the mayor of Boca Raton, Susan Haney, to declare the month of March a month of civility in honor of the programs we're doing on campus. And you'll see a sign out in the lobby, please sign it. Our entire campus, our students, our faculty, all the way up to President Ross himself are signing this to make sure this place is a civil zone. Um, we want to take what we're doing here, bottle it, and show the world this campus is a civil zone. All opinions are welcome here, but hate is not welcome at Lynn University. On that note, it gives me great delight to introduce four of my favorite political leaders, uh, and we're blessed here in South Florida to have such talent and people of such integrity. Ted Deutsch is a graduate from the University of Michigan and a graduate of the University of Michigan Law School. We got some Michiganders here. He was a member of the State House, uh, a member of the State Senate, uh, now a member of Congress, where he serves on the Foreign Affairs Committee, the Judiciary Committee, and I'm proud to announce the ranking member of the Ethics Committee, Congressman Ted Deutsch. <laughs> Lois Frankel is a graduate of Boston University and of, uh, there we go, and of Georgetown Law School. I taught there. Uh, and uh, a longtime mayor of West Palm Beach, a member of the legislature, a member of Congress, where she serves as the co-chair of the Women's Caucus, Congresswoman Lois Frankel. <laughs> Lori Berman is an honors graduate of Tufts and completed her law degree at, there we go, every college. Uh, it's on the top of my son's list. Uh, we're going back again this summer. Uh, graduate of George Washington Law School, a uh, member of the state uh, legislature where she serves also as the chair of the Women's Caucus, Representative Lori Berman. <laughs> Steve Abrams is an honors graduate from Harvard and completed his law degree also from, yeah, there we go. Completed his law degree also at George Washington University. He's a former aide and a former law clerk in the Reagan administration, and he clerked for the current Chief Justice of the United States Supreme Court, uh, John Roberts. Uh, he's a longtime former mayor of Boca Raton and a member of the uh, County Commission, Commissioner Steve Abrams. And I want to introduce uh, three of our student, a couple of our student leaders on campus, two. Okay, a uh, group of our students, Jennifer DeSouza, Joanna Jimenez, and Brianna Randall, uh, will be asking uh, questions of our uh, distinguished guests today. These ladies serve on our student government. So, and at the conclusion of our program, if you have any questions, I'd like you to hang around and we can do a little bit of interaction, and then um, we've got to get everybody moving out. Um, let me start by uh, throwing it to the ladies and uh, go ahead and open up our questioning. Go ahead. We'll start with the questions over there. Yeah. Hello. Guy, uh, well, good morning and thank you for being here today. Um, since we were all really, since the movement is about Project Civitas, we were really came up with these questions about civility. Like, what are some of the root causes of incivility in our politics today? So the root causes of incivility in our politics today. And is it new? Who would like to answer that first? I guess we'll go in seniority. Congressman Deutsch, and then we'll, we'll yeah, go ahead. Uh, um, As the uh, ranking member. Uh, thanks, and, uh, and thanks for the question, and thanks very much for, for hosting this sure. uh, really important discussion. I think we could use uh, more of these discussions about civility in Washington uh, these days. So hopefully, what what starting here will uh, will eventually make we'll take its way, the show on the road, make okay. its way up north. Uh, there, the the causes of civility I think are many, um, but I'll I'll just give you a, a couple of thoughts. First of all, it's not new that there are that emotions run high, certainly in Washington and Tallahassee, I mean that. 
Um, the fact that that uh, Senator Sumner had been was caned at yes. one point. Um, yeah. an anti Senator Charles Sumner, anti-slavery yeah. senator. I know what a, yeah. a historian you are, um, and and beaten unconscious. I'm mm -hmm. I'm happy to tell you that hasn't happened since I've been in Congress. Uh, <laughs> but I I I think there's this this move to the extremes that that we see where people stake out these positions uh, and are unwilling to to talk to others that it feeds into and is fed by social media and cable news networks that focus on, on one particular view or the other um, and advance their own interests, frankly, by, uh, by making light of, criticizing, marginalizing other views. It's important that we, we actually find ways to have discussions together instead of rushing off to our, our own specific camps. That's what contributes, I think, in a really serious way to the, the incivility that we see. Congresswoman, would you like to? Well, hello, everybody. Great to be with you. And I'm glad to be with these very civil colleagues of mine and students. Thank you for your participation. Of course, Dr. Watson. And what a good, what a nice group here. So let's see. Listen, there's always been incivility in politics. It used to be, it used to be, uh, you know, there would be duels, right? Yeah. Politicians would kill each other uh, with uh, weapons. Now it's with the Twitter accounts, right? <laughs> and I think Ted is, uh, Congressman Deutsch is correct. I mean, I think because of so... Call I'll call you Ted. <laughs> See, we're very civil to each other. But really, because of social media and cable news, I mean, obviously, it's, the incivility is spread much quicker. And it, so, you know, here, here's, here's going to be the, I think, the challenge for us today is, can I be civil in talking about what's going on? Uh, because I do think that today, incivility has been heightened by, I'll say this as respectfully as possible, by a president who insults everybody. So, right? I call him the insult Tweeter in chief, was that in, in civil? In civ was that? In, I don't know we if that call was. Call it the way it is, and then we'll figure it out. I don't know what it is, but I, I, I really think that it's very important for uh, leaders in whether it's uh, teachers or politicians or whatever that we people or grandparents, you're role models, and so people see how we behave, and then. When your leader is misbehaving, it's very easy for other people to, you know, fo follow that lead. So, uh, I'll I'll pass it on. I so, know I'll have more to say. So, social media possible problem. Leadership it starts at the top and comes down. Representative Berman. Th thank you, and thank you for having me here today. I'm really happy to be part of such a, an illustrious panel. And Dr. Watson, you always do amazing programs. So, thank you. I'm really happy to be part of it. Um, Clearly, um, social media, gerrymandering, which leads oh, yeah. to, I think, people going to, we have districts where people are elected who they reflect the far right or the far left, and there's less willingness, I think, of people to compromise when you come from a district like that. Yep. And interestingly, in the state of Florida, we have term limits. We don't have term limits on, in the congressional level, but I think term limits contribute to a lot of the incivility hmm. because we're only there for a short time and we don't build the relationships. And so much of the civility is based on your relationships. If you have a relationship with someone, it's hard to get up on the floor and, and disparage them. You, and the other thing is, uh, I think that the way we get to civility is we don't disparage people. We talk about policies, not individuals. We need to be discussing the policies, not attacking people based on their personalities or whatever you know other grounds that you're trying to attack them on. Um, and then the final thing I wanted to say about what I think has contributed to the incivility is our campaigns. Mm. Um, yeah. We've really had, you know, there's a lot of money in our campaigns now as a result of Citizens United, which I'm so happy that Congressman Deutsch is trying to Taking work a leadership role against. and trying to reform yes. that, yeah. And uh, thank you, to, thank you, Congressman Deutsch. The Citizens United versus the FEC case from 2010. Yeah, and so, right, it's interesting you say that about 2010 also because iPhones were 2007 and Facebook was 2004. So it's all these, we've had, we've always had historical 
in civility, but all these things uh, came together in the, in the around the 2010 period, which I think, so we are at a high of, in, of historical tension and historical incivility. We had it when we founded the, the nation, we had it when we had the Civil War, and I feel like we're at a high right now because of social media. That's changed the whole discussion. And campaigns, because we've had such brutal campaigns where people are attacked, and I think some of that leaches over into the process. So mm. I'll let my colleagues Absolutely. go on, but those are so my So we're at opinions. gerrymandering to the list, as our distinguished panelists know, of the 435 seats in the House. This past November, scholars estimated that only 31 of them were even competitive, because all the rest were so safely gerrymandered. Uh, Commissioner Abrams. Well. That is why you have intense campaigns that are very divisive Primary. because there are only 31 contested yeah. seats. Yeah. Uh, I love serving at the local level. We don't get into a lot of ideological or partisan debates. I tell my constituents if they want to see that, just turn on C-SPAN. <laughs> uh, but we do certainly have, uh, have our fair of divided issues on development or growth or the budget or other issues, but I think at the local level we're able to uh, work uh, more uh, collegially together. There are only on the county commission seven of us, uh, and a lot of it is out of necessity. I'm one of two Republicans on the Palm Beach County Board of County Commissioners, uh, and so if I want to get anything done, I'm going to have to be cooperative uh, beyond the fact that, yes, my parents uh, did teach me to be a civil person. Thank you, mom and dad. Uh, but also, getting back to uh, districts, uh, my district, which is comprised of, uh, of southeast and coastal Palm Beach County, all of Boca Raton, Delray Beach and Boynton Beach, west of Military Trail, and all of the coastal communities up to and including the town of South Palm Beach, is actually a rare district that is evenly divided. I have about 36% uh, Democrats, 34% Republican, and the balance, 30% uh, independent. So again, if you want to get something done, and I'm a person who's always been of the belief that politics is about problem solving and getting results, and not necessarily about posturing, that uh, you have to maintain your civility in order to achieve that. Thank uh, you, Dr. Commissioner. Watson, yeah, I, sure. I want to just add to something to what's been said here. But I, I, uh, I was on a local government too. I, I agree with you yep. absolutely. Local government is, you know, if someone is there. So you both say there's less no, incivility. If there's a pothole, the you government. can't blame it on the president. But here, 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 here's the thing: the the gerrymandering the districts uh, is a reason why there are very big philosophical di differences, and might exp and also explains why there is a lack of bipartisanship. But we should not confused by partisanship and civility. Because I, uh, the, the gerrymandering g gives, allows people to get away with being c c civil. Because they're it does in not, such safe seats, right? But it is not an excuse. And I don't really think there is really any excuse for not being c civil. Uh, because you can, uh, all of us uh, have had to work with people on uh, you know both sides of the aisle and you can, the question here is, is can you have respectful disagreements? And that's really what I think this is about. Not, you can mm -hmm. be firmly against something that somebody else is for, but you have to do it with, re with respect. By the end of the hour, we will have answered all the questions and set a new path for civility for the nation. Uh, ladies, another question. All right. So our next question is in terms of the impact of incivility. Um, so in what ways do you see it personally or have you experienced in your jobs or positions um, hmm. as a political leader in civility? How do you feel it personally in your positions as political leaders? Have you seen it get worse? I mean, is it tough to do a town hall? Is it tough to get bipartisan co-sponsorship? Are you seeing it? Uh, let's go in reverse order then, uh, Commissioner Abrams. Well, yes, having said all that about the local level being less uh, partisan, less ideological. I did mention that we have had divisiveness and uh, I have had years where I've served uh, at the local level on very polarized uh, city councils and what happens is uh, it just sort of devolves into 
to the point where if uh, someone on the other side says black, I say white. If I say white, they say black, regardless of what the issue is. And uh, that is unfor the unfortunate consequence of that that then has to be repaired, that things just uh, uh, go beyond uh, the issue at hand. And of course, the issues that are important then fester or don't get solved. Is it harder, Commissioner, today to build a, a, a coalition to try to get something done? Is it more difficult yeah, today? Sure. Than I mean, once you're okay. polarized and sides okay. are drawn, yes, it's much more difficult. Okay. Representative Berman, examples in your own career of this incivility. I, I think the biggest examples are um, on social media, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. I think we see when you take a position, you get attacked immediately on social media. And, and that's really where I'm seeing the, the, okay. a lot of the worst part. And I think the anonymity of social media gives, feel, gives people, okay. they feel licensed. And also, you know, we've seen, like Congresswoman Frankel said, top down. So people think it's okay. Somebody does it, and then the next person thinks it's all right. So we're really, you know, we took some positions even within our own party. You know, it's not just, it's not a, a Democratic, Republican kind of issue. If you take a position that somebody in your party doesn't like, you get attacked on Facebook. Representative Berman, you and the other uh, panelists, knowing that you're immediately going to get attacked on social media as a consequence of this, as soon as you introduce a new bill, are you then preemptively preparing a, a, a response? Is this something that all of you have to sit around and think about? What are we going to do on social media as soon as they say horrible things about us? Absolutely. I mean, but that's, I think that's always been part of the legislative process. You always have to be prepared for whatever your opponent's arguments are. So, you, you know, whenever you introduce a piece of legislation, you look at it from the pros and cons. But I think it's, it's gotten much worse, and you have okay. to be more proactive on social media. Are you seeing it at your town halls, uh, Lori? Um, we haven't done as many town halls, so I'll, I'll defer to that. Okay, to let me go Congress Congresswoman Frankel and then Congressman Deutsch. <laughs> Lois? Well, I, I very rarely look at my social media. It's done by people under 30 in my office. <laughs> <laughs> but I have a great defender. My, my mother, who's 91, she is the, res the responder for my social media attacks. <laughs> right? Hey. So. If, if you go on my Facebook... So that's the Bubby policy, everybody. A, so we... The Bubby and policy, the, yeah. The, and there's Dorothy Frankel telling everybody what a great uh, congresswoman they have. I, I, <laughs> you know, he, 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 I mean, here's, here's the thing. I, uh, first of all, and I think Ted, I'm going to assume we have very similar experience. Uh, I, I, I pretty much represent the values of my district, so uh, I don't... My, you know, there are a few people that may, that maybe will come after us, but but you know, he, I think it's um, important to stand up for your values, do what you think is right, and I think you understand as a politician, there's going to be people who are going to criticize you, and you learn. And I've been doing this for a long time. I think when I remember when I first got elected, if I if I ever got criticized by anyone. It would take me six months to get over it. Now it takes me about six seconds. And it's just a matter of experience. So, uh, Thick skin is a necessity today? I, 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 or, you know, as my mother said, if you, can't, if, you, if you can't take a joke, don't go into politics, really. Yeah. Congressman Deutsch? Uh, well, first of all, I want to uh, thank Lois publicly because um, your mother has also come to my defense. <laughs> so, I told so you I, the Bubby policy. This I, uh, is. Uh, I, I really am grateful for that. Uh, I, the answer is yes, of course it has, we've run into, into this, uh, and I, I, I think Lois's advice is very sound. If you don't check the Facebook comments and the tweets back at you, um, it's, all, it's a lot easier to, uh, uh, to not get bogged down, and uh, particularly when people can do it anonymously and say terrible things, and so I think it's important. To, to just continue to focus on the issue. There are plenty of issues that we work on uh, that, we, that we work on in a bipartisan way and, a, and an entirely civil way. And so I'm, I'm the ranking member of the Middle East Subcommittee. We work on foreign policy issues, uh, on Middle East issues, on U.S.-Israel relationship. We do that in a bipartisan way. Um, every day I'm in Congress, and there are, there are differences of opinion, but we we understand the importance of the issue, and so we find ways to work them out. I'll give you an example, though, where that's not the case. The, the fact that, that Lois and I needed to, uh, to, to participate in a 25-hour sit-in on oh, yeah. the House floor right. 
just to have a conversation about gun violence when if you talked, if you talked to our colleagues personally and said, look, there are a lot of issues, there, there are lots of, of gun-related issues that we can debate, the assault weapons ban, we can debate banning high-capacity magazines, I, we can have those debates, but don't you agree that we should be able to take steps to ensure that if you're too dangerous to get on a plane because no, you're on the no-fly list, that you shouldn't be able to go in to a gun store and walk out with a semi-automatic assault rifle? Right. And the answer, yeah. And the answer, thanks. And the answer from, from the overwhelming majority of, of my colleagues that I talk to on both sides of the aisle is, well, course. yeah, that's fair. Um, but this gets back to some of the earlier issues. You, it, we couldn't, we can't get a debate on these issues in large part because of special interests, special interests that because of the Citizens United decision can roll out uh, massive attack ads and spend an unlimited amount of money. And all of that helps to, to cause people, members of Congress to sometimes uh, sit back and not put themselves out there because it's easier to not uh, get involved in an issue, even if they think it might be the right one, um, than it is to get out there and risk having these outside groups spend a lot of money against them right. in a primary, and that's what's so sad. Can I ask a follow-up to that, Congressman? So is it a case of one? Is it the squeaky wheel gets the grease that maybe you and, and your colleagues on both sides of the aisle get along nine out of ten times, but the one area where you don't get along, is that that's what the press is reporting? Or well, Yeah. I, first of all, I wouldn't say nine out of ten times. but, uh, but the, Six? But there is, there is a lot of agreement. And getting back to what we discussed before, and let's just be clear, neither Fox News nor MSNBC has any interest at all in putting me opposite uh, Ileana ross uh with whom I work on foreign policy and, and we, we passed an eating disorders bill together, or, or me and Tim Murphy, and the Republicans that I work with where we've gotten things done. It doesn't make good TV, okay. cable TV, for us to sit there and say, well, I think my colleague's a real leader and I'm proud to work with him. Well, I think she's terrific. And they, it doesn't work and so they don't do it. So you never hear about the work that happens every day to support veterans and the work that, that work, the, the broad support for scientific research. And, and you're right, it doesn't okay. fit the narrative. And then you, yeah, there's a lot of attention paid to the issues where uh, things don't happen and the debates get really ugly. So the partisan press is contributing as well as special interest money and folks are afraid to stand up to the special interest, whereas in private, you're getting along very well. Well, yeah, I think, I think this, I th listen, we, don't, we do not wrestle on the floor of the House or even in the committees. I mean, really, we're not fighting, we're not spitting at each other. And a lot of the Republicans are friends, but he, he, what just happened with health care bill is a perfect example of incivility because uh, this, was an, this was really an example of when you say strange bedfellows, uh, politics made strange bedfellows. Uh, the Democrats were solidly against this uh, health care, Trump care bill, which was a sick bill, which would have taken health care away from 24 million people. And uh, the Democrats stood tall against it. And then we got help from this freedom, what they call themselves the Freedom Caucus. Freedom Caucus. And this is a very, they're, they're very, very uh, right uh, to the right, over the, you know, to the right. And uh, probably on most things, I would say we have, Ted and I would have total disagreement with these hmm. folks. But, but they, on this bill. But, yeah. the, but look what's happened now to them. They are being shamed on Twitter by someone, you know who, right? <laughs> Congresswoman, may I? When, when liberal Democrats were working with conservative Republicans to oppose the repeal, replace, were, were the relations friendly? No, or was well, it, no, no, we were not working with well, them. Well, I mean, but both were voting against it. But would you say the relations were frosty or were they non-existent? You just happened to share a position. It's very interesting. I don't find the relationships frosty at all. The politics are frosty, the okay. issues. Uh, okay. But, you know, we're, on a personal level, you know, we Get smile. Along. We smile at each I, other. I just, right? I would add, I, I encouraged some of, some of my Freedom Caucus uh, friends to keep it up. 
you stay okay. <laughs> stay with it. Um, not okay. on ideological grounds, but because we um, we we were both we were we were both aiming yep. to stop a piece of legislation that would have done really terrible things. Pigs are going to fly because of these alliances, right? Who would have thunk it? Uh, ladies, another question. Well, hello. Thank you all for coming today. Um, so. I love that we mentioned social media already. Would you say that social media and media itself is creating fear and hate? Is it social media's format that is contributing to it? Well, and, and along that line, what do all four of you do besides releasing the bubbies? Uh, what do all four of you do to mitigate the criticisms and the hate on social media? Are you using them to get out the bill? For example, Representative Berman, you have several bills you're pushing. Are you using social media to talk about it? Congressman Deutsch, are you engaging the public on your efforts to try to reform or replace Citizens United, whether it's an amendment or in what respects yeah, are you dealing with absolutely. it? Absolutely. So one of my big bills this year is um, uh, something I thought was non-controversial, but we can't get a hearing in Tallahassee, and that's equal pay for equal work. And thank you. And because we can't get a hearing, we decided we would use social media. So we held a big rally in Tallahassee. We put it on Facebook Live. Okay. We actually arranged, we coordinated to have rallies locally. We had one in West Palm. We did one, we had a sponsor in Orlando. Um, and then we gave people email addresses okay. and telephones and numbers. And we said, please call the chairman, please email the chairman and ask them to agenda this bill. So absolutely, we use social media for a positive too. You know, we want to make sure we get our word out. You know, it's being used for some negative reasons, but it, it's a real positive tool So for using us. it as a vehicle to get folks out to a rally and then passing out contact information. Commissioner Abrams? Sure, I'm on Facebook and I find it to be very useful and it is a double-edged sword, but it has a lot of positive uh, implications. You can provide the public with a lot of information. I can get off my chest. If my constituents want to get, get something off of their chest, I can get things off of my chest as far as uh, uh, promoting or defending my point of view on issues. And uh, in fact, things like uh, sit, the, the sit-in on the House floor was a yes. product of uh, social media, you know, got covered yeah. extensively through that and picked up by cable TV. So I'm not sure that where that falls in on the civility uh, spectrum. but. Uh, it can be a tool for good. Uh, on that note, both of you, um, do you have a policy that you will refuse to engage when somebody takes the low road against you? Do you tell your staff, don't do this? Uh, because, you know, the argument is that unlike a conversation which is uh, contextual and is the speaker and a listener, uh, social media oftentimes yells at folks or lacks context, even if you put a lot of emojis in. So do you all have a policy whereby don't go low on social media, or do you ever engage people on? Yeah, I mean, I would say we don't have an official policy, but um, I, I try not to engage okay. when we get in that situation. You know, I mean, what, like you said, the, the Michelle Obama theory, when they go low, we go high. Um, so we try not to engage in that it, when people get to that level. And I, and I will, I have to admit here, even in front of everyone, I will unfriend people if it gets yeah. to that point, you know, because we don't want to have, you know, that kind of level of discourse. Okay. Well, I, what, what I would say, first of all, I, I, I cannot censor my mother, who has, who has been accused of stalking people on the internet. Uh, but, is, is, is she here today? No. Okay, I was going to, yeah. Okay. So, uh, so, Representative but, but, Berman's mother's here but, today, yeah. But here, here, here's what I would say. Our, I mean, our office has, a, I mean, we have a policy, which is always to act civilly to everyone, regardless of what their point of view is and I wanted to you asked uh, how we're using social media again I don't I don't uh, operate my my own Facebook and web page we have the I have as I said if, if they're under 30 or maybe I think it's under 25 today they they do this but uh, I'll give you an example uh, maybe you read recently about a uh, scandal really with the United States Marines, and my, incidentally, yeah. my son is a Marine, so I yeah. uh, have a great respect for our military, yeah. but they uh, posted literally thousands of pornographic pictures of, of, of women in the Marines. Yeah. So uh, we are having, the uh, Women's Caucus is having a Facebook town hall, not in a Facebook hearing on, on uh, Wednesday in Washington on the non-consensual pornography in the U.S. Marines, and you will be able to watch that 
live on my Facebook, and we're going to have some of the victims of the uh, of of this uh, the social media right. co come on in. But I want to just tell you how bad it's gotten in terms of trying to get uh, cooperation from the other side of the aisle. Uh, you would think that this is a very uh, non nonpartisan kind of issue, right? I mean, how wrong is it to have people who are serving your country to be shamed on social media? Uh, it, it really is a disgrace. Uh, we have been trying, the Democratic women have been trying for weeks to get the Republican women to participate with us in this mm. hearing, and we cannot, not because they think it's right what has been done, but it's almost like they are afraid of their shadows. I really think that it's got to a point where they are afraid of their shadows and that if every witness is not scripted and controlled and they don't know ahead of time what is someone's going to say, that someone's going to come after them. Okay. All right, um, another question? Um, I don't want to... I want to appoint Congressman Ted Deutsch. Um, we know you're big in social media, and you always say your thoughts and concerns. Have you had any response or hostility back at you due to the way you express your concerns or thoughts? Yeah, either on social media or in town halls, yeah. So, okay, so when, what kind of responses are you getting? Are you getting right. people? People that are taking the high road, low road on this, and, and you're both, let's do social media and town halls. Right, well, I, I actually, um, uh, I do a lot of my own social media, though I'm not under age 30. Um, and, and especially on Twitter, I'm just curious, um, can I just see, show of hands, how many people here are on Facebook? Okay. Um, how about on Twitter? Right. So, I won't even ask about Snapchat. So. Um, <laughs> Uh, so I, I try to I, I, I try to get ahead of um, of some of the criticism. I mean, people like to, to go on the attack, so I try to get ahead of it by trying to let people know where I stand on a regular basis. We started about six months ago posting videos. Originally, it was one a week. Now we're doing sometimes one a day. Just just little updates from Washington on things that are happening, what we're seeing, um, the direction that Congress is going. And, and yes, there are still people who are critical, but by tweeting a lot and by posting a fair amount, um, it's, you don't really leave room for people to, to come in and just attack because they try to do it and we're, we're making clear what our position is on the right. next issue. I don't, have, I don't have time or the tolerance to engage with people, especially on, on Twitter. There's some people on Facebook who will post the same thing. No matter what I'm talking about, they have a point they want to make. They're going to post it on every post, even if it's not relevant. They're entitled. We'll, we'll send them a response. But on Twitter, where, where the level of discourse is sometimes really awful and people will tweet things that are not just disrespectful, but mean and anti-Semitic, I might add, um, I don't, there's no reason to engage with them. Uh, it doesn't, they don't want to be a part of a conversation. If they wanted that, they would come to town hall meetings where sometimes it gets a little heated, but at least there's the opportunity to engage yeah. in the discussion. Have your town hall meetings gotten a little bit dicey? Any of you? Yeah. I mean, ours, we've found uh, over the, the, the past few months that the town hall meetings, that the, the level of engagement is higher than I have ever seen, that there are people coming to town hall meetings um, who have never participated in any political event uh, in their lives okay. because they just want to, to do something now. Okay. And that's, I, I think that's a, a okay. huge I'll tell, you, I'll tell you something. Here is, I agree with that. And I would say I've done a number of town hall meetings. And I will tell you, the energy is so high. It's the first time that no one has fallen asleep at any of my, <laughs> really, I mean, that says a lot. Now, I want to tell you, I, I don't, um, I ne I've never responded to anyone on Facebook because, as I said, I stay away, but I post. So right now, I'm going to put my, here we go. I'm on a video. If you go to uh, Rep. Franco on Facebook, you will see this video that I'm doing right now. I am with this great crowd at Lynn University, and we're talking about civility. There we civility. go. 
And you thought no one was under 30 in this uh, panel. So, uh, and no one's sleeping in the audience. Another question, ladies, and yes. we'll start with uh, Commissioner Abrams. Go ahead. Oh. <laughs> so if you guys do have views that are more religious, I'm gonna push a few buttons here. If most of us are on the panel are Jewish, how do we face civility when we have different opposing views on religion? Okay, so the rise of anti-Semitic nonsense, and do people get personally ugly regarding religion? Have you experienced it? Have you seen it? Congressman Deutsch mentioned earlier that you get a lot of that on, or you get some of it on Facebook. Uh, like I said, we were just at Vassar where swastikas were painted on that remarkable campus. Commissioner Abrams? I'm not sure what, what the question is. Uh, has, have you seen any religious intolerance? Has there been a lack of religious? Oh, I mean, locally, we have had a lot yeah. of examples of that of course it's you know blamed on uh and it's been na uh nationwide some in some quarters blamed on the president and then uh, it turns out the person who's doing it is a jewish guy sitting in tel aviv or something uh so uh you know you you just obviously reject it whoever the source of whoever is the source. Is this incivility? Has it flow? Is it the well, piggyback just, on that? It's not incivility. It's just out and out. Well, no, right. Bigotry. But I'm saying the incivility in politics has it undermined a sense of interfaith dialogue, and we seem to be have been making progress a few years ago in interfaith dialogue or trialogue, bringing all the, for example, the monotheistic faiths together. Is are you seeing more of this now that it's undermining us, or is it undermining your ability to talk about Middle East peace? Uh, because anti-Semitic or, 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 anti or Arabist or whatever positions are jumping in on the conversation. Well, I, I would say, I, I would, I would say um, yes and no. Um, I mean, I, look, the, the, the executive order on, on immigration and the, the a, attempted Muslim ban wound up having, I, I, particularly here in South Florida, um, having a in many ways, uh, sparking some really positive conversations. Okay. There, there are a lot of interfaith, interfaith conversations going on um, as a result of, of this effort to, to target a particular faith. And so, so there are, um, at, at synagogues and mosques, at churches, uh, there have been meetings to talk about shared okay. experiences, um, shared Share, unfortunately, uh, every group at one point or another has been on the receiving end of, of hatred right. and bigotry. Uh, and I think that there's, there have been some stronger uh, bonds that have developed as a result of this, which I, I hope will, will carry forward, um, and I think it's going to be necessary. So an I, ironic... I, but I, th here's, okay, I think this. I think you have to realize that when you, if you go, around, you go along with, or you were silent, when there is bigotry and hatred towards one religion, it is going to come back around at some point to your own religion, uh, right? And so uh, this, I, I, am, I am as worried about the uh, hatred and bigotry being spewed from the, some those at the top towards Muslims as I am about the swastikas on somebody's, painted on someone's garage. You got to keep in mind, there are more Muslims in this world than Jews, right? And so uh, the fact of the matter is, I'm, I'm just going to give you an, an, an example that something just happened that I think uh, with the president's budget, he actually, you probably read that he's proposed to cut the State Department uh, budget, which is a mistake. But what was inside of it? Uh, one of the proposals was to which was good, which was to continue to fully fund uh, our military assistance to Israel. But what he was, next thing he was doing was instead of uh, continue to uh, fund some of the Muslim countries, let's say Jordan or Egypt, some of the people who are our allies, now he was turning it into loans. Well, how does that look? That doesn't look good. In fact, when we were lobbied this week by one of the big Jewish organizations, APAC, that what's one of the issues they brought up? They said is don't be treating uh, Israel different in that capacity than some of these other mm. countries because where will the hatred come back to? Right. Yeah, I've talked to colleagues of mine at universities around the country where they've had 
let's say, an anti-Semitic or an, an, uh, um, uh, you know, Islamophobic kind of response on the campus. And they've all said it's ended up energizing the campus where every, all the students of all faiths go out and walk. And it's actually had a boomerang effect, if you will, and it's been positive. Ladies, another question? Um, this kind of just ties on to that, but I think definitely, you know, these things have to be discussed, um, whether it's in the actual churches or mass, wherever. Um, and these feelings need to be released um, so that way we know or we're conscious of the others around us. Like we said earlier, you have to respect one another. Um, I think um, Congressman Deutsch, you mentioned it. Yep. Um, we have to have respect for one another and from that we can go forward. I mean, you don't have to agree with their beliefs or what they believe in and everything, but you do have to respect it. And sure. So I think that's one of the biggest things right there. And like you said, like without discussing it, without having these emotions happen where, you know, something happens on a campus like that and then these students are all walking out of all different faiths, you realize that something's wrong there. And that's when the discussion right. comes about. Yeah, it's been remarkable here at Lynn. I've, I've seen very little of it. I know that when I lecture at other camp, well, virtually nothing, I've had students come out of the closet, if you will, in class. I've had students of other faiths get into conversations, but it's all been above board. Whereas when I lecture at other campuses, I've been, I've been boycotted. Uh, I've had people come to my lectures at another campus and scream and yell. So it, it, it does tend to get dicey. Yeah. Um, uh, we're, we're still, yeah, she's just offering a view. Go ahead, question. Um, so as uh, Dr. Watson says, here on campus we have a, it's, it's well known because of, it's one of the most internationalized universities. Mm -hmm. um, in classrooms, out of classrooms, our friends in, in we always talk about, uh, like we have many religions in just like in a parking lot, you can see people from, uh, that are Jews, people that are Muslims, Christians, anything that you can think of. And it's really nice when we talk about what things we can do or how we can share our, our emotions and our concerns about the things that are happening uh, in the world. But we also ask ourselves, what are representatives, congressmen, and, and people in like all, all around in Washington or your colleagues, what are you guys doing in order okay. to spread our, our, like our emotions or, or, make, or make these things like how you say, like how these feelings that... Okay, let's do this. And tied in that at the county level, at the state level, at the national level, schools, K through 12, college campuses are overrun with a lot of hate crimes, hate speech, swastikas. Uh, is this a topic that the U.S. Congress, the Florida legislature, the county commission, are you getting involved to make sure that there's a viable curriculum in our schools? Are we providing our schools with funding? Are we equipping schools in a way that they can combat this? What are we doing about it politically? Well, the school board is. Of, of course, at the local level, we're in charge of, of law enforcement. Right. And uh, obviously, uh, the sheriff's uh, office is very vigilant in investigating all of the incidents that we hear about, and our state attorney is vigilant in prosecuting them. But we're kind of fortunate in uh, being in South Florida, we're one of the if not the most diverse area in the country. So uh, especially, you know, while we have those incidents, politically, all of our constituents are, make up, are made up of all of the different religious groups that you mentioned. So we being very uh, right. good politicians, of course, don't want to alienate any of those people. And so, uh, you know, it's, it's the areas perhaps of the country where the constituencies are very right. uh, homogeneous. Has, you um, have a lot of has, you, you're, never met a Jew or a black person. The, the, the sheriff's office and some of the local school board people, have they come to you and said, we've been seeing a spike in hate crimes? Or are the Palm Beach County School Board, the sheriff's office, have they not seen the spike here that we're seeing around the country? Well, as I said, we've had our share of incidents. Right. Uh, Representative Berman, at yeah. the state level. Thank you. Um, so first of all, I commend you here at the university. I think that's great. And I think it's very much what I said in the beginning about relationships. When you know someone, it's harder to hate them. And that's what happens in our society. We have homogeneous communities, unlike South Florida, where there is a lot of hate. And I think it's great that we have these relationships. Um, on the state level, we actually just have had 
pretty much the Jewish caucus took it among themselves to meet with the Florida Department of Law Enforcement in response to the recent spike of anti-Semitic incidents. And we actually were briefed about the person who was found in Israel. And one of the things they told us is they are going out through the state and they are Good. very proactive. Good. They meet with all the different organizations, in, not just Jewish, Muslim. They showed us charts from you know all the different potential hate crime targets and they give them support about how to do their security at their facilities so that they're prepared, who to call if there is a problem, who to immediately call, what to do. So it is being handled very proactively. I think you all should know in the state we are making that effort to make sure that we address it. And we do have a hate crime statute on sure. our books in Florida and we do continually look at that hate crime statute to make sure it encompasses any of the potential okay. hate crimes that arise. And Congressman Deutsch, at the congressional level or the work with the Justice Department, the Attorney General, uh, what is happening at that level with addressing all this? Uh, well, there's a, there's a serious effort uh, at the Justice Department in Congress at, again, different, uh, at, in different ways. The Judiciary Committee I serve on uh, has looked at this issue of, of hate crimes uh, I'm the co-chair of the anti-Semitism task force. We're looking at this issue, but I, I wanted just to get back to what Lori just said, which I think is really relevant to the, the general topic here, which is we, we're, we're less likely to face uh, difficult issues, uh, not even just hatred, we're, we're less likely to face these issues of incivility if we know each other better. Right. And that's a big issue in, in Congress, there are lots of things that we can do so that we know each other better, so that we have, we have the opportunity to spend time with one another. Uh, that helps to break down barriers so that we can ultimately work together in a more civil way. Okay, Congresswoman Frankel. Well, I'll just say this simply, and that is this. I believe that the hatred that is spewed by the President of the United States of America is embarrassing. And it, it, it denigrates our country. And I tell you, I wake up every single day and I would l like to shout at the top of my lungs. It's, I'll tell you, you talk about trying to be civil. He's testing me. <laughs> and I'll tell you what, I think that's why, I think that's one of the reasons you, you see these town halls filled all over the country because people are waking up and say, saying, not in my country, you know, we are not going backwards. We have, we have time for one more question, uh, one more question, and then I want to move to allow everybody some solutions when this, and, uh, and Congressman Deutsch, at, at the end I want to talk about some of the stuff you and I have talked about. So one more question, ladies. We'll start off with Congresswoman, uh, Congresswoman Frank, Frankel, excuse me. Um, for somebody who publicly endorsed Hillary Clinton, do you feel that your role in her campaign is now affecting you in your role as your position right now? Okay. Uh, having endorsed uh, uh, Hillary Clinton's campaign, after the election, is it more difficult for you to reach across the aisle? Or do you have a role in trying to uh, be someone that holds President Trump accountable because of the endorsement of, of uh, Secretary Clinton? Well, I, I endorsed Hillary Clinton because uh, sh she was the candidate that best represented the values that I share, that I hold. And you know, we haven't mentioned it here, but I will tell you, probably one of the biggest causes, and we're gonna find this out more and more, of the incivility in this country is called Russia. Russia. And their fake news stories that they put out on the internet uh, is causing a lot of chaos. But I, I, would, I would say this, uh, you know, I. Yeah, I'm disappointed that Hillary Clinton wasn't, wasn't, isn't president, but I think uh, for me it's, it's about values and for me representing my constituents. Okay, uh, to move to a close, um, Congressman Deutsch, um, you and I have had a number of conversations. I would like each one of you to identify a couple of specific things that we can do to ratchet down the incivility. What are you each personally doing to try to promote an agenda of civility? Congressman? Uh, well, thanks, and, and thanks again for hosting us. Uh, and we have talked some about this. Uh, there are some specific things I think we could do in the U.S. House of Representatives 
to address this very issue of civility, um, I'll, give you, I'll give you three. First, one of the, the big problems in, in the House is that there are 435 members. It's really hard to know everyone when there are 435 people. Um, it would be terrific as a start if we at least knew people's names. So when I, I was in England recently, and in the House of Lords, they've added TV screens so that when there's an exchange taking place, uh, it has the name of the person who's speaking, the name of the person who's responding, the name of the person who's sitting in the, in the chair overseeing okay. this. I think something that gives us okay. a chance to know one another's names makes it, it's a lot, a lot harder to attack someone as a crazy person if you know a little bit about them or at least know their name. So that's one. So do we go with name tags the first couple months? Of so, so as a matter of yeah. fact, one of my ideas is that we, and it sounds, it sounds silly until you stop to think about it. If you, if you require people to wear a name tag just for, the, just for, for a month that, that has their name and the state that they're from and not their party, yeah. um, you at least, it will spark some conversations and there, are, I've been in Congress now, this is my fifth term, and there are people that I know have been there at least as long or longer, but it's a little awkward at this point for me to walk up and say, hey, nice to see ya. It's, I've been waiting to introduce myself for the past uh, eight years. years. So, yeah. but, so, and then that, just one other quick idea. Okay. Uh, we have two cloakrooms off of the House floor. There's a Democratic cloakroom and a Republican cloakroom. <laughs> it's true. One, and these are places with couches and TVs and a snack bar and uh, there's no reason that for at least, uh, just for some minimum period of time, I would be happy to start with a couple of weeks. Instead of Democratic and Republican cloakrooms, if you had one for members from even number districts and one for members from odd number districts, it would force us to get to know one another a little better. Yeah, so, just a couple ideas. Great idea, simple. Sometimes the, uh, you know, the profound is in the simplicity. Um, I'm, a, I'm a simple man. <laughs> this is all so, I can understand. So what do we do? Do we, can you, how do you go about introducing that in the House? Uh, does it need to go through some sort of procedure through the leadership? Or what can we do as constituents? Yeah. Can our students go to, I, I'll invite our student government to go to Instagram and Facebook and start sharing your ideas. What can we do to make this happen? Um, sure, well, the, originally, I'll be perfectly candid. Originally, I, want, I thought this would be a great thing to do at the start of the new Congress. As you might have noticed, after this last presidential election, um, there wasn't, there didn't seem to be a great desire for everyone to find ways to get to know one another right off the bat. So uh, my hope is that uh, that as we move forward, uh, that there'll be there will be an opportunity uh, to raise the issue with the leadership, with the House Administration Committee, uh, to give us the chance to, to move forward on simple ideas for a short period of time just to, to try it out. Lois pointed out before, we have lots of relationships with members from the other side of the aisle. This would just be an opportunity to, to expand those uh, so that we understand that there is, there is a story behind all the people who were there, even if, as we listen to them, we, uh, we don't understand what that story is or why, frankly, they think the way they do. Let's at least start at the personal level. All right, I'm going to make an assignment as a professor. We have leaders of our student government sitting here, our campus civility club, I saw them in the audience, and we have several leaders sitting off stage, political science majors, and for the public. All of my students, go on our campus Instagram, Facebook sites, and tell the story that Congressman Deutsch just had, and say we have a member of Congress working on it. Let's get the word out and put the heat on it. We could do that at the state level. We can do it at the county level. Uh, so there's your assignment to my well, okay. students. Okay, and I, I want to give a little different, I want to just give a, another perspective. First of all, you can see that this is probably one of the most decent, kind gentlemen in the United States Congress. <laughs> really. And if everybody was as good as you, we'd be doing well. I have a little different approach, because I don't, I, <laughs> not that I'm not This friendly. is why we invited you. Because <laughs> I don't really care the name of the people in the Freedom Caucus, but... Uh, he, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to speak up against ugliness. I'm going to try to help us get, wait, got some more. I'm going to, I am going to, I am committed to work with colleagues to get to the bottom of this Russian connection. I'm going, I'm just channeling my days from the 60s. I, I am going to fight hard, stand up for freedom of the press, freedom of religion, 
Women's right to control our own bodies, right? Because if we don't do that, we don't have any freedom. And I'm going to uh, continue to, to work with really good people like Ted Deutsch to... Uh, and, and, let, and Tyler, tell you something. He's going to be fighting for the same causes. Yeah, let me trust me. These are not mutually exclusive That's ideas. Right. I mean, no, let's, he's let's be clear. He's one of the best fighters that I know for good and we, things. Let's all commit ourselves as we fight for tolerance and inclusion and understanding and or multiculturalism, whatever uh, your issue is, as we do it, to not just preach to the... Uh, converted, that we all need to continue to reach out to others. I think there's probably no better lesson. My personal hero, Harry Truman, grew up as one of the most bigoted, racist, anti-Semitic households imaginable. But because people reached out to him and he developed friendships, he would turn out to be one of the great lions and giants of inclusivity uh, and human rights of the 20th century. By people reaching out to him, and by him reaching out to Art Vandenberg and Republicans and doing this in a bipartisan way. Representative Berman, some specific solutions and what, what can you do to address this? <laughs> thank, thank you, and, and thank you for putting this together. Um, interestingly, in Tallahassee, we do have a dining room that's together, and we have a member who just became a member of Congress, and he came back and complained bitterly about the separation and said it has led to a lot more, you know, people not being as civil and not cooperating together. But um, I think for us in Tallahassee, we need to continue to find grounds of bipartisanship. I mean, we didn't talk about it that much, but we do, like it was mentioned, Congressman Deutsch mentioned it, we agree on a lot of issues. And, and I know personally, I continue to be a bipartisan sponsor. I sponsored a bill last year with someone about solar power, that which became Amendment 4, which we voted on. I, um, so the, the, bi, the, partisan, the, the sponsorship was across the aisle? Correct. Okay. And I have a across the aisle bill this year on mental health. Okay. So we continue to find issues that we can work on. And I think that's the thing, is we need to find the issues where we can work together. Um, we talked a little bit at the, the beginning. We're having what we call socially divisive week this week in Tallahassee. Oh, yes. Tell us about your week yeah. coming up. What so, are the issues that so you're going to be working on? Next issues week. that we, we do it once a year. We are doing a, um, a stand your ground, which is a gun issue. We are doing a school prayer bill. We are doing a bill about where liquor should be sold, and we are doing an abortion bill all in one week. Um, so yeah, those are so, not fun issues to be discussing. I'll, I'll bring either the aspirin or the drinks for right, you. So exactly. Yeah. yeah. So it's. I mean, unfortunately, when we have weeks like that, that those are the weeks where things do tend to get in a lot. We lose civility a lot often, but we just have to keep focusing on the issues, and that's what I'm going to continue to do, is focus on the issues and not the personalities. Not the personalities. Thank you. Commissioner Abrams, last word. Well, a couple of things. First, uh, to uh, turn down the temperature some and not uh, take every opportunity to throw lighter fluid on uh, volatile issues that uh, divide us and, uh, and, and work toward... Uh, consensus on those issues uh, where we can come to agreement. But Common ground. We, um, we talked a lot about the districts and about how we now have uh, on both the state and congressional level, uh, because of redistricting districts uh, that are either overwhelmingly Democratic or overwhelmingly Republican that lead to a lot of uh, the division and then uh, extending sometimes into incivility. So what I, and frankly, when we talk about people that are looking over their shoulder, they're looking over their shoulder at a primary challenge. Uh, so uh, you see this uh, from my perspective on the uh, nomination of the Supreme Court Justice. Let's, uh, uh, Judge Gorsuch, let's just stipulate that a Democratic president uh, is probably not going to nominate someone who stands on uh, the policy questions of the day uh, will find agreement with Republicans. And vice versa, a Republican president is likely not to nominate someone who will find favor with uh, the Democrats. And so uh, really then you look at what are the uh, person's qualifications, uh, his or her temperament, uh, his or her record, and judge it based on that. But we're, we're seeing with the Gorsuch nomination is not that kind of examination, in my opinion, and just a, uh, a divided vote uh, on party lines that shouldn't necessarily be. Uh, in terms of, 
uh, redistricting then, yes. what I think should occur is to uh, ha go toward an independent commission yes. in the state of Florida yes. that will, uh, every 10 years, yeah. uh, draw the lines here. Because what you've gotten in here, we have a room full of folks from Palm Beach County, and uh, we always had in Palm Beach County uh, north-south districts. Uh, divided generally by I-95, and forget uh, 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 partisanship, these were good districts just for good government. Because as you know, our transportation system runs north-south, our beaches run north-south, the intracoastal runs north-south, the housing patterns in the east are different from the patterns uh, out west. And so uh, we had on the east side, we had a very, uh, we had, a competitive seat for many years. It, it went back and forth between uh, Republicans and Democrats, and it was good for the people. Now, uh, due to uh, a loss, well, due to a number of factors, and that's probably worth a whole nother debate, but in any event, uh, as a result of Florida Supreme Court ruling, we now have two generally east-west districts, uh, and in particular, if you live in Boca Raton, luckily we are now represented by a congressman who has some roots in Boca Raton, but uh, the fact is that Boca is now a chimney on top of a Broward County district. So just in terms of good governance, uh, not the optimal uh, shape of a district. Uh, and so I think that that is the cause of a lot of the problems that we have been discussing today, just from a good governance standpoint, not even from a Democratic or Republican standpoint, because Congresswoman Frankel represented me last year, Congressman Deutsch uh, will represent me this year, and I have great relationships with them, and we work each and every day to solve local problems very effectively. Uh, but when we get to the, uh, the issues that uh, are taken up in Tallahassee and in Washington that create a lot of division, it would go a long way toward having uh, congressional and legislative dis districts that make sense. Yes. Congressman, yeah. I just, I, wanted to, I, I just wanted to try to, uh, to, to, as we move to close, uh, to go out on a high note. Um, first, the example of civility that um, Steve Abrams and I set um, so that um, he can speak, um, I think, appropriately about the way that a Supreme Court justice should be judged and ultimately uh, have a vote on that Supreme Court uh, justice nomination based on the qualifications, exactly what uh, so many of us believe was the case with Judge Garland when he was appointed by President Obama. And, and um, but just... Just, uh, I also felt compelled to do that since, since I didn't want Lois to lead anyone to believe I'm a shrinking violet. And finally, <laughs> fi fi finally, um, on, a, on a really positive note, uh, at a time when there are those in senior positions in government who continue to question whether climate change is real and, and man has anything to do with it, um, my, my colleague, our colleague, Carlos Corbello and I, uh, he's from Miami, uh, we, we launched the bi he's, he's a Republican, a Republican. we yeah. launched the Bipartisan Climate Solutions Caucus, which, which as of yesterday, and the goal was to build it out with an even number of Democrats and Republicans, as of yesterday, we just added two more, we've got 17 Democrats and 17 Republicans who wow. are meeting to talk wow. about wow. how to address climate change. Wow. So, We've identified some macro issues such as gerrymandering, campaign finance reform, maybe the media cherry-picking stories, a partisan press, the social media, clearly a culprit. But in the end analysis, it comes down to what we all know. It's about interpersonal relationships. It's about leadership flowing down from the top, but it's about the integrity to maintain those interpersonal relationships. I wanted to leave everyone with a brief story. Uh, it's one of my favorite stories, and that has to do with the framers. When the framers gathered in 1787, they realized it was a lot harder to put together a government than to achieve their independence. There were massive egos in the room. They did not get along. They tried to do it the summer before in Annapolis, and it was an embarrassing failure, and it was anything but civil. So when they gathered in the summer of 1787, the thing that I think saved the Constitutional Convention, and historians agree with me, the thing that makes our nation unique is this. They sat down and they thought, 
what are the fundamental, the philosophical building blocks of a democracy, of popular government. They tried to identify them. Once they identified them, they wanted to build them into the Constitution. Having done that, they wanted to follow them that summer. And what the framers came up with in their genius was the following. Compromise, cooperation, and consensus. Those are the three things that the framers embraced as being the core governing principles of a democracy. That's how they conducted themselves that summer. And I think if we take those three together, what we're essentially talking about is civility. And uh, therefore, that is our challenge today. As we close, we have a new civility club on campus and a Project Civitas. And our campus and our students wanted to present civility awards to the four distinguished guests who came here today. So I thank you for coming, everyone. Drive safely, and we hope to see you back at Lynn University. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Civility Awards.